back in October, when my uh, uncle had to go into the hospital, we, uh, as a family working with my aunt, tried constantly to meet with the doctors. We knew that uh, my uncle had, uh, had cancer in the past, and we wanted some kind of idea as to what his medical condition was. Well, if you've ever been in this kind of situation, you know how hard it is to meet up with the doctors. They'll be here in the morning, so we wait all morning. They'll be here in the afternoon, so you wait all afternoon. And this went on for several weeks as we watched my uncle slowly decline. Uh, as the last remaining McLean from our family, he was the last of seven brothers and sisters, and I was uh, really the oldest and the closest nephew, I wanted to be there to try to provide for him an accurate understanding from the doctors of his medical condition, because very often when they came in, uh, he wasn't uh, cognizant of what was going on. I remember when we finally had the opportunity to meet with the doctors, and the news was not good. My uncle not only had cancer, but it was inoperable, and it wasn't curable. And I had the responsibility of going in and telling him about that. I remember praying with my aunt before we went in to share with him. It was a very, very difficult message to bring, to be able to say to my uncle, Uncle Peter, it's inoperable, it's incurable, and you only have a few weeks to live. But that was the information. That was the knowledge that he needed so that he could prepare for the remaining days that he had. That was not a very pleasant experience, but it was a message that had to be delivered. In a similar way today, we have reached a message in Hebrews chapter 10. And it's not a particularly pleasant message message. There's some bad news in this particular section of Hebrews chapter 10. And so I must give the bad news that willful, defiant sin against God is going to incur an eternal judgment. But what is better today is that not only do I have to deliver the bad news, but I have good news to deliver too. And the good news is that sin is not terminal. But Jesus Christ has died for us, has paid for that sin, that although sin will take our life physically... It will never take our life spiritually, and that there is great hope in Jesus Christ. So open up your Bibles with me, if you will, to Hebrews chapter 10, and beginning at verse 26. Hebrews chapter 10, beginning at verse 26, opens up with a very somber message. It says, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth. No sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and a raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. You can see what I'm saying when I state that this message begins with bad news. It is not a pleasant message. 
and yet it's an important message because it is a part of God's word. And the question that we must ask ourselves in Hebrews chapter 10, particularly verses 26 through 31, is who is this man that the writer of Hebrews is talking about? Is this person a believer or a non-believer? Is he talking about Christians here or non-Christians when he talks about this willful and defiant sin? Well, if the person is a believer, then the question is, is this a temporal judgment or an eternal judgment? As you know, there are people who are Christians who believe that you can lose your salvation, that sin of any kind breaks your relationship to God, and until you confess that sin, you are in danger of eternal judgment. So is this person a believer, and if they are a believer, is this a temporal judgment or an eternal judgment? Or another way of saying it is, does this person lose his rewards, that is, his rewards of heaven, or does he lose his salvation? Now, in answer to this first question, we have seen in these first ten chapters affirmed over and over and over again what we call the eternal security of the believer. We have seen that God honors his covenant and his commitment to his children and that once we are saved, we are always saved, that God will persevere with us. And once we are his children, we will always be our ch his children, that we cannot lose our salvation. Now, if this situation is such that he is talking about a non-believer, if he is talking about a non-believer, then how has this non-believer, as we will read, received the knowledge of the truth and been sanctified because these are terms that you would think were describing a Christian. He has received the truth. He has been sanctified is what the text says. Sanctification is generally uh, a term that we understand for somebody who is a believer. And if this person is a non-believer, then there is only one conclusion, and that is that the judgment that is spoken about here is eternal. In all the book of Hebrews, there is more, no more difficult passage to interpret than Hebrews chapter 10, verses 26 and following. And for myself personally, I would say, in all of the Bible, I know of no other passage that is more difficult to interpret than Hebrews chapter 10, verses 26 and following. Because when you put the evidence uh, on a chart, let's say, there are significant evidence that this is a believer. There is significant evidence that this is a non-believer. And so what we must do is weigh the evidence and ask ourselves what is got the heaviest evidence and can the other terms be understood in another way. So we're going to work through this a little more teaching than preaching today because of the difficulty of the passage. So let's return to Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 26 again and look at this opening verse. The writer says, if we deliberately keep on sinning, the NIV translation, this phrase refers to sin that is willful sin and defiant sin. In the Old Testament, it was described in the figure of speech a sin in which a person raised their fist defiantly to God and said, I am going to do what I'm going to do. I am going to sin in violation against you and your character. The particular text is found in Numbers chapter 15, verses 27 through 31. In Numbers chapter 15, it describes an unintentional sin. 
sins out of ignorance, sins out of weakness of the flesh, sins that are part of humanity. And we all have those, don't we? I know I do. Those sins of weakness. But then Hebrew, or Numbers chapter 15 talks about that defiant sin. The sin where you say no to God, where you are rebelling consciously against God, where you are blaspheming God. For those, the law of Moses only had condemnation and judgment. If we sin willfully and deliberately after we have received the knowledge of the truth. Now, the terminology to receive the knowledge of the truth is used in the Bible of people who receive Jesus as their Savior. John says it this way, but as many as receive him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. But to receive the knowledge is not a term that is exclusively used of believers only. You remember back in Hebrews chapter 4, the writer of Hebrews spoke about the children of Israel who came out of Egypt and how they saw and understood the mighty acts of God. And yet they turned away from him because they did not mix that knowledge with faith. You remember the illustration that is used there is the illustration of mixing of colors in a paint can. That when you would take the paint and you would put the colors in and then you would blend it all up, it would become so blended that it was one new color, indivisible and unified. Well... It is possible to receive knowledge, but not to mix it with faith. To have information, but it doesn't provide any transformation in your life. So if we sin willfully and deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, the writer of Hebrews says, no sacrifice for sins is left. Now it's interesting In just the previous verses of this chapter, in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 18, he used this exact same phrase. There no longer remains a sacrifice. There no longer is the need of a sacrifice. And in Hebrews chapter 10, when he used that phrase, 1018, it was the conclusion of his argument when he said, let us embrace our great high priest. Let us embrace the faith. Let us confidently move forward because once you have believed in Jesus Christ as your Savior, there's no longer a need for any more sacrifices. And so there it was used in a positive sense of of stop worrying about these Old Testament regulations. Stop worrying about your catechisms and your confirmations and all of your good works that you think are going to get you to heaven. If you've believed in Jesus... It's a done deal. But now, he's saying to them, you know what? If you defiantly uh, shake your fist in the face of God and you reject him, there's no longer a sacrifice. Because Jesus is the only sacrifice. And if you reject that sacrifice, there is nothing that you can do to bring yourself into the favor or merit of God. Yes, if we reject this sacrifice, there is only a fearful expectation of judgment and of a raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. The term for enemies of God is one which means to oppose God, to be contrary and hostile to Him, to be an adversary or an opponent. Now, all of that terminology, to me, does not describe a believer in Jesus Christ. There are times when we get angry with God, when we're disappointed, when we're frustrated, when, uh, when things happen to us and we blame God rather than ourselves or others, and, and we can get into a state of bitterness and disappointment. But that's not the characteristic of our entire life. That often comes out of a pain of disappointment 
because somebody who you believe loves you did not take care of you. And there is still the essence of a relationship there. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 28, the writer is going to give us an illustration going back to the Old Testament law. He says, anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Now, this is found in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 2 through 7. According to the Old Testament law and the laws of Moses, the laws that the people covenanted together with, when people committed defiant, willful sins against God and against the community on the basis of two or three witnesses, capital punishment was administered. Now, it's interesting, you know, we look at that and, and we say, boy, that's barbaric and that's awful and that's terrible. Uh, but one of the phrases that occurs uh, frequently enough in the Old Testament is this, that by doing this, they would eliminate the sin from the community. They would deal justly and eliminate the sin from the community. That was the purpose. The purpose of capital punishment in the Old Testament was to show God's divine judgment on capital crimes, but also to preserve the community by not allowing that behavior to flourish in the community to the death and the detriment of others. And so it was viewed and should be understood as a compassionate, loving God seeking to protect his covenant community. Well, if anyone rejected the law of Moses and was judged, verse 29, how much more severely do you think a man deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified him, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace. Now, these three actions describe that high-handed, defiant fist in the, in the face of God. Who is this willful, sinful, uh, uh, defiant person? Well, first of all, it's a person who looks at Jesus Christ and says, he is not the Son of God, and who tramples the Son of God underfoot. Now, the uh, terminology for trampling somebody under your foot was a sense of disgust, of rejection, of even hostility towards another. This defiant person wants to trample underfoot Jesus Christ. And it acknowledges him as what here? Son of God. This person is denying the deity of Jesus Christ. He's denying that Jesus Christ is God. And anybody who denies that Jesus Christ is God cannot be saved. Romans 10, 10 and 9 says that we must confess with our mouth that Jesus is what? Lord. And Lord there is used from the book of Isaiah, which acknowledged that the coming Messiah would be Yahweh himself. And so there is a trampling underfoot, the Son of God, a denial, a disgrace, a rejection of his deity. Secondly, it says, who is treated as, un, as an unholy thing, the blood of the covenant that sanctified him. The second thing that this defiant person does is they look at the death of Jesus Christ and they say, well... He was just another man. See, to treat as unholy is a term which means to treat as common, as every day. What they're saying is, you know, there was nothing special about the death of Jesus Christ. He, he was just a martyr. He got caught up in a movement and died. Oh, good man, heroic man, sincere man, but just a man. And there's nothing special about his death. Well, the writer of Hebrews has told us quite differently. In chapter 10, he has said that Jesus Christ has died once for all. 
Paul says the just for the unjust, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. A person who looks at the death of Jesus Christ and says, you know, he was just another man, is a person who is rejecting not only the deity of Christ, but the redemptive salvation that he has given. He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. It is a defiant, sinful thing to say that the blood of Jesus Christ was just common. The third statement that is made here, or I should finish this uh, last statement, the blood of the covenant, and then there's this little phrase, that sanctified him. Now, for those who hold that this passage is describing a believer who is going apostate, who is turning away from the faith, and is going to incur temporal judgment in this life, they will look at this phrase, and this is the strongest phrase to describe a believer by which he is sanctified, the blood of the covenant by which he is sanctified. Well, isn't sanctification a term that is used for Christians? And my answer is yes. Several times in the book of Hebrews it is talked about the family of God being sanctified. But sanctification is used in the Bible at times of a general sanctification. In other words, a sanctification that applies to people generally when they come under the influence of the community of faith. Open up your Bibles with me. We're going to come back to Hebrews, but open up your Bibles with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And I'd like to show you a passage where the terminology is of sanctification is used, but it does not refer to a person who is saved. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. There's a message within this passage that we will get to another day. But in 1 Corinthians 7, 10, he says, To the married I give this command, not I, but the Lord. A wife must not separate from her husband. But if she does, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And a husband must not divorce his wife. To the rest I say this, I not, uh, I, not the Lord, if any brother has a wife who is not a believer and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. This is a situation, remember, the gospel is coming to the Gentiles, it's coming to the world. You have two unsaved people. One becomes a believer in Jesus Christ. The non-believer does not like the faith of the believer in Jesus Christ and is looking at rejecting or breaking the marriage because of that. The scripture says the one who is married and is a believer in Jesus Christ must not divorce the unbeliever. That's the context. And if a woman has a husband who is not a believer and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband, notice this in verse 14, the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife. The unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean or common. But as it is, they are holy, or the word sanctified. Now, verse 15. You see, you've got unbelieving husband sanctified, unbelieving wife sanctified, You've got children sanctified. Verse 15, But if the unbeliever leaves, let him do so. A believing man or a believing woman is not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. How do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? Do you see what this verse is teaching? It's teaching that there is a sanctifying effect upon the life of a family, upon a relationship, when there is the presence of Christians. But that sanctifying effect does not guarantee or mean that the person is saved and is a Christian. And so there is precedent 
for understanding this idea of sanctification. That within this community of the Hebrews, that there were people who had received the knowledge of the truth. They had been influenced by the sanctification of the community, but then they have turned a defiant hand against God. And they are denying the Son of God, deity of Jesus, and they are denying the redemptive payment of the death of Jesus Christ. And finally, if you'll turn back to Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 19, the third thing that they do is they insult the Spirit of grace. The Spirit of grace being the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit who works in our hearts and lives, who convicts us of sin, who, who when we believe in Jesus Christ, causes us to be born again, who puts his seal, the guarantee of our salvation, upon our hearts. And rather than listening to that pulling of the Holy Spirit, rather than yielding to that conviction of the Holy Spirit, and those of us who are believers in Jesus Christ, uh, we know about that conviction, don't we? We know about how the Holy Spirit worked in our hearts and lives, how he wooed us to the love of God, how how he worked in our hearts and lives and worked through other people and worked through the word of God to convict us and convince us that Jesus Christ died for our sins and that he was raised. We know about that work that he has done in our hearts. But the one who is defiant has insulted the Holy Spirit and has turned away from him. This is the same kind of of terminology that is used of those who committed the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit in the days of Jesus when they looked at the life of Jesus and they said, the miracles that you do are not from God, but they are from the devil. And they they insulted the Holy Spirit. These three characteristics of the defiant person Convince me that we're talking about a non-believer here. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 30. For we know him who said, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, and again the Lord will judge his people. Verse 31. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of of the living God. This particular quote is from Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 19 and following. And... um, also from Psalms 135.4. These are passages that were used in the Old Testament to describe God's judgment that fell upon the children of Israel who were brought out of Egypt after they had received the knowledge of God, after they had seen the power of his mighty works and turned away to idolatry and to self-will. Hebrews chapter 10 Verses 26 to 31. Who is this man? I think this man is a non-believer who will incur the final judgment of God if they remain in their defiant mode. That's the bad news. And with a heart of compassion and thanksgiving, compassion for those who are in that state, thanksgiving that... God has saved me out of that state. I share with you very clearly the word of God. But there is good news also in verses 32 through 39. Look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 32. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 32 through 39, the writer says we must confidently endure persecution so that we may receive what was promised and preserve our soul. Hebrews 10.32 says, Remember those earlier days after you had received the light. Actually, again, here our Greek translation is uh, is, uh, in the passive tense. Not after you had received the light, but after you had been enlightened. After God had worked in your heart and your life and had brought you to a place of enlightenment. Remember those days after you had been enlightened. 
when you stood your ground in a great contest in the face of suffering. These early Jewish believers suffered significant persecution. They were chased out of Jerusalem by the defiant Jews. They were chased out of Rome by a deranged Roman emperor on several occasions, Claudius, later Nero, and others. Christians, particularly Christian Jews, had become the scapegoats for many, many problems in society. And this particular community of Jews had had to stand their ground in a, the face of great suffering. The second characteristic, verse 33, sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. The word for publicly exposed was a word when a person would be taken and grabbed off of the street and they would be put up on the podium of the public place of justice or governmental meetings. And then they were accused and they were insulted and they were berated for something. And this community of Jewish believers, and there were some Gentiles too amongst them, probably proselytes, they had been publicly put up in front of others and insulted. Verse 3, at other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. There were other times when people were put up for public uh, uh, humiliation and uh, accusation, and they would step up and they would say, I am a brother or a sister in Christ with this person. I don't know if you've ever seen that go on at work, but in my experiences back when I was in the plumbing trades, there were times when there were Christians that would become uh, the center of insult or the center, the focus of, uh, of, of uh, persecution. And I just felt compelled by God. Compelled, so annoyed by him <laughs> that I said to myself, you know what, i got to stand up and just let people know that I'm a Christian too and that those people are all right. And in fact, they're my brothers and sisters in Christ. We need to stand together against the persecution of the world. But they stood side by side with those who were tr so treated. Verse uh, 34 gives us a fourth one. You sympathized with those in prison. Uh, people were imprisoned for their faith. You remember in uh, the book of Acts, you've got Timothy and Titus who endure persecution. You've got Paul and Silas and Barnabas at times. You have Paul getting a letter from the Sanhedrin Council and going from community to community, and he's imprisoning people, and he's even putting people to death. And we have the example of Stephen, who was taken outside the walls of Jerusalem, and he is stoned because of his message and his faith. Yes, they were willing to identify and sympathize with those who were in prison. And finally, verse uh, number five, they joyfully accepted the confiscation of their property. You remember what Paul says in, Hebrews, in Philippians chapter three. He says... I rejoice in the loss of everything. And I count knowing Jesus Christ as my Savior as greater worth than all the things that were lost. The Apostle Paul came from a very wealthy family. He was a very wealthy man. And he had suffered the loss of all things for the cause of Christ. Now, for you and I today, living in Livonia, Canton, Metro Detroit, Michigan, uh, we can be thankful that we don't incur this kind of persecution. Even though we may someday, and if we do, it will be a tremendous blessing 
of testing our metal or our commitment and it will be a preserving and purifying experience. But as we have seen and heard from our missionaries in the last year and we read about in various mission magazines and even hear reported on the news that our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world are suffering intense persecution. Intense confiscation of their properties. Enslavement to communists, to Muslims, and to others. And I think if I were in Asia or Africa or many other parts of the world and I was preaching this message, they would be saying, Amen, Amen because this is exactly where they are living. They are incurring this intense persecution and imprisonment and confiscation. But in the days of the writer to the Hebrews, he says, you joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property. Why? What is it that carried them joyfully through this persecution, this imprisonment, this suffering of loss? It's because they knew that they had a better and more lasting possession. Jesus said it this way. Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great and is in heaven. Jesus said it this way, A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And it is a fatal flaw to think that if you are rich in the goods of this world, that you are rich towards God. The truth of the matter is, our life does not consist in the abundance of things, but in our relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as this community of believers is experiencing all of this humiliation and persecution and confiscation of their property, they had a joy in their hearts because they realized that everything that was being taken away from them was temporal, was temporary. But there was nothing that their adversaries could do to take away their eternal life, their eternal inheritance, and all the blessings that would come. Notice verse 35. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. Richly rewarded. You do need to persevere or to endure would be a better translation. You do need to endure so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what God has promised. And in the book of Hebrews so far, we have heard... The writer of Hebrews tells us God has promised us rest from our labors, rest from our work. Isn't that wonderful, the idea of rest? He has promised us riches in glory. He has promised us relationships, relationships with him, relationships with his son, relationships with each other. He has promised us Great rewards. Yes, we need to endure in our Christian life. We need to endure in our pursuit of holiness. Because when we have done the will of God, we will receive all that God has promised. Verse 37, For in just a little while, Jesus who is coming will come and will not delay. Verse 38, but my righteous one will live by faith, but if he shrinks back, I will not be pleased with him. The writer of Hebrews tells us that that our hope is in the coming of Jesus Christ. Paul said it this way, looking for the blessed hope in the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. In the midst of the troubles and the trials and the persecutions of life, our great hope is that Jesus Christ is coming again. 
And that we don't have to live forever in a world that is dominated by sin and crime and corruption and, and, and disease. But there is an eternal home which we have. Then the writer quotes from the book of Habakkuk. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38, is a quote from Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. In Habakkuk, Habakkuk as the prophet is standing up and speaking to the children of Israel. And he is asking God, God, why, why do you make my righteous soul suffer in this corrupt world? When are you going to bring judgment upon the Jews? And God says, I'm going to bring judgment. It's going to be the Babylonians. And Habakkuk says, oh my God, what do you mean, the Babylonians? They're more evil than the Jews. And God says, don't worry, I'll judge them too. And after Habakkuk has struggled with these messages, he warns the people that the just shall live by faith. And those who hear the message will flee from the judgment. Today, we have the opportunity of fleeing from that judgment if we have been those who have been defiant in our sin, are defiant, denying the deity of Christ, denying his redemptive work, denying the work of the Holy Spirit. We can flee from that judgment by fleeing to Jesus Christ. But we are, those, we are not those who shrink back and are destroyed, verse 39, but of those who believe and are saved. Yes, we will not shrink back to destruction. Judas was called the son of perdition or destruction. The Antichrist is called the son of perdition or destruction. God's judgment will fall upon those who willfully, defiantly turn against him. That's the bad news. The good news is that we can turn to God, we can believe in Jesus Christ, and we can avoid that judgment. We must continue diligently enduring the persecution that comes with the Christian experience, enduring the hardship of the struggle against sin, and as we endure, God will bless us with a great reward.